Hello, everybody. It's good evening. I've been dreading all day long of saying that because I thought I was going to say good morning. In my mind, I kept replaying, I'm going to say good morning. I'm going to mess it up. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much for tonight. I, I thank you that we have a place where we could come and we can worship you together, Lord, as, as one body, one collect group, with one mind, and one hope. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you just be glorified as we worship you in song and as we open your word and, and, and learn of you, God, <clears throat> that you would be here with us, that you would bless us, bless the worship and bless the teaching and everything that we're doing here tonight and our fellowship and all of it, God. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry. That was a test.
tell you a story real quick because anytime someone allows you to have a microphone, you have to tell a story. So I was reading a book today. It wasn't the Bible, but it was good. It was, a, it was based out of a, a verse on the Bible. And the guy was talking about a painting that was made in the 1800s. And it was a painting of a young man playing chess against the devil. And the young man had this terrible look of despair on his face because he knew that he had lost. He was checkmate. And apparently, before the devil learned fiddle, he played chess. And he, uh, he, the kid lost his soul. And they showed this painting to one of the world's best ch chess players at the time. His name was Paul something. And uh, he said, you know what? Let's, let's re recreate that. Let's make that board. Let's bring that down. Let's make it. And he, in his own mind, being the best chess player there was, stood in for the boy and made the right move and checkmated the devil. Not very many people saw the move except for him. And I just want to use that as a small illustration because I don't want to use chess as an illustration for what's going on in our world. I would rather use something like Twister. <laughs> we got a game of Twister going on out there. But who, what we're doing tonight, we're singing to the person who created the game. He created it so he could be glorified in it. And so in all this craziness and all these end times, you, you, you can, I'm so glad you guys are in here and you're not watching the bad news of what's going on in the world. And we can come here and we can focus on Jesus and we can allow him to refresh us with his presence. Amen? Jesus checkmated Satan for us. Let him checkmate our flesh and ourselves also tonight. And let, let's worship him. Let's sing praises to him. Let's glorify him. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Sing it out. Destined to die and poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sins, but suffered as if. Awesome and great. 
we're going to overcome.
to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell? again with us he does is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the lion of Judah who conquered the grave so much that you are so worthy and Lord for us to get outside of ourselves for just a few minutes and just sing about you sing about your greatness sing about your majesty your power because Lord you're bigger than this world you're bigger than us you're bigger than our problems and I pray that if we can maintain this perspective of you're worthy you are powerful you are good Lord that would give us so much peace so I pray that you would keep us in this place. And Lord, as we study your word, that those things would sink down deep into our hearts. And Lord, just as we're learning, that we would also be growing. Lord, we love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Well, I'd love to blame it on somebody else. <laughs> They're leftovers. Thank you. All right, guys. Stand by. You thought Daniel 9 was complicated. <laughs> <clears throat> we will try to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. So we're going to take a look at Daniel 11. It's going to take us three weeks to look at Daniel chapter 11. 
And Daniel chapter 11 has <clears throat> encouraging things we need to understand about God uh, that will help us today. Now, the good news of Daniel chapter 11 is we don't have to wonder how it's going to be fulfilled. Now, sometimes when we go through the book of Revelation, we look forward. Um, sometimes we can be confused by how all the pieces fit together. The beauty of prophecy is when we look back on prophecy that's fulfilled, it is all lined out just so. So Daniel 11 is, is going to be dealing with um, primarily the king of the north versus the king of the south. And it is, as far as I know, the only chapter where God speaks prophetically over the 400 silent years. Now, if you remember, when we talk about the 400 silent years, those are 400 years after the end of the prophets until Messiah. God didn't say anything to his people. When I say God didn't say anything, they had the word of God, but they didn't have any living prophets. No one prophesied for 400 years. So the time period that that's dealing with we see in Daniel chapter 11. So we're going to jump in. We're only going 20 verses tonight unless we don't make it that far. So that's possible. I think that's on. Am I dead? Yeah. Do I got to turn it on? That'll help. Sorry. Is that better? Okay. I can always holler. All right. Daniel 11 uh, verses 1 and 2. And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he will stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. All right, so we look at Daniel 11. Remember what was going on. Daniel 10, we saw Daniel receiving a vision, praying to God. He sends an angel. The angel tells him, hey, I came uh, as soon as you started praying, but I was, remember we had angelic battleground going on. He was withheld by the prince of Persia. Michael, the chief prince of the nation of Israel, came to set him free from the prince of Persia, and now he's, he's talking to Daniel. He said, Let me, let, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you understanding about the vision that you've seen. So he says there's going to be, Daniel's during the time of the Persians right now. So he's telling Daniel something significant is going to happen in the kingdom of the Persians that's going to lead to the kingdom of, of the Greeks. You all remember this, the, the prophecy, the dream of the statue. Head of gold, chest of silver, body of bronze, legs of iron. You guys with me? You had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Right? The, the, the kingdoms of men, always one passing to the next, to the next. That hasn't stopped, by the way. We still have kingdom passing from one to the next. If you've been around as long as I have, you know there are some countries we used to be able to find on a map you can't find anymore. And uh, maybe there will be more before the, our current time is over. Kingdoms of men are always falling into disarray, falling apart, they, they cannot stand. The final point of the dream is there's a rock in heaven, not cut out with hands, that's going to destroy all the kingdoms of men and become the kingdom of God. So we know the Persian Empire is going to pass to the Greeks. And so the angel's telling Daniel, this is how it's going to happen. you got three more kings, and then you're going to have a really wealthy one. The three more kings that you have is Cambyses, Pseudo Smyrtus, and Darier, uh, Darius, sorry, Histaspus. You want to try to read them later. So those three guys, they're going to have those three kings and then a rich one. You know the rich one. His name is Xerxes. If you read about him in the book of Esther, his name is Ahasuerus. Remember? Esther wanted to go before the king. She was a little worried because if he didn't ask for her, he could lop off her head. You guys remember the story of Esther? Because the, uh, Haman there wanted to kill all the Jews, right? Wipe out the nation of Israel. So this is that king, husband of Esther. He poked Greece with a stick. 
It was said he had a million-man army. He commanded the army called the Immortals. Ever heard of them? There were so many of them, they weren't really immortal. There were just so many of them, you killed one and another one stepped up. So there was a battle, maybe you guys have heard of it, in a place called Thermopylae, uh, called the Hot Gates, where the, the, the legend is 300 Spartan warriors held off a million-man army. So those numbers, none of those numbers are accurate, by the way. But that battle was Xerxes stirring a hornet's nest in Greece. Now, it's going to be a while. The hornet's nest is stirred up under Xerxes. But this is what the angel's telling them. Look, there's going to be three more kings, and then there'll be a strong one. And he'll be rich, and he's going to stir up Greece. He's going to stir up everyone against Greece. Look at verse 3. Then a mighty king shall arise who will rule with great dominion and do as he wills. Is there a mighty king that comes out of Greece? Is there like one that pops right to mind? Right? What do we call him? Alexander the Great. That's right. Alexander the Great, whose father kidnapped um, one of them philosophers. Which one was it? Plato, Aristotle, right? He kidnapped Aristotle, who was taught by Plato to teach Alexander his son. Apparently, if you get kidnapped, you do whatever the guy tells you to do. So, <clears throat> so he was trained. Look, it says, as soon as he is risen... His kingdom will be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, not, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom will be plucked up and go to others besides these. Again, when we look back at prophecy, this is given long before the battle with Alexander the Great. And the Bible says not, he's going to take it, he's going to conquer the world, it's going to happen quick, and then he's done. Right? Isn't that what happened? And is his kingdom, like all other kingdoms, going to be passed to his children? No. It's not going to be passed to his children. It's going to be passed to his, uh, to his generals. He started his conquest in 334, and he died in 323. That's not a lot of time. That's why the Bible describes him as a leopard with wings. He conquers the world fast, and then he dies he has sons, his sons Alexander IV and Hercules. Yes, Hercules. But those are both killed by the, the generals who want the power. And when David on, or sorry, not David, when Alexander on his deathbed was asked, who's going to rule? The generals got around him. You're dying. Who, who takes over the kingdom? Do you know what Alexander said? Let it go to the strong. So they killed his two sons, and the generals divided it into four parts, just like Daniel said. Just exactly like he said. Antipater and his son Cassander, they take Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus takes Asia Minor. Seleucus, he's going to take the rest of Asia except lower Syria and Palestine. And the Ptolemies are going to take Egypt and Palestine. The scripture says it won't be as strong as it was under Alexander. It never was as strong as it was under Alexander. And the focus for the rest of the chapter is going to be on the king of the north and on the king of the south. So I, I got a couple of maps I'm going to throw up and a whole lot of notes. Hopefully that will go up for you guys. Okay, so take a look at the first map. When I say we're dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south, I'm talking about the brown and the green. The other two kingdoms, other than the fact that they exist, that's it. The king of the north is green. The king of the north is green and is south of the Black Sea. Does anybody know why that should matter? Because a lot of people want to say that there's going to be an army put together by Russia in the last days because they're the king of the north. But they're not the king of the north anywhere in the Bible unless we decide on our own to make them the king of the north. You're looking at the king of the north. Russia, by the way, is all that light brown above the Black Sea. And if you can see the rest of the map, which you can't, but you guys can look at a map, it, that there's all of Russia is above that, that light brown. In fact, where they're fighting, if you, look at the, if you look at the Black Sea, 
That little peninsula sticking down into the Black Sea is Crimea. Right above that is Ukraine. Right above that is Russia. Okay? So when the Bible's talking about the kings of the north and it's mentioning them, even when we look at Ezekiel 38, it's talking about the area that we're looking at in green and brown, purple, and gold. Those are the areas that are being mentioned biblically. Okay? So it's okay. I, my mind, my mind, when we talk about Gog and Magog, and we think about the end days, end times, last war, Gog and Magog's example of the Battle of Armageddon. You guys heard of Armageddon, right? Where all the armies of the world come against Israel. Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38, what's happening? All the armies of the world coming against Israel. Uh, Revelation 20, what's happening? All the armies of the world coming against Israel, called Gog and Magog. Who delivers the nation from those armies? The story is the same in all three, right? God delivers them. He doesn't need any of their help, does he? He doesn't need any of their help. He delivers them in Ezekiel 38. He delivers them in Revelation 19. And he delivers them in Revelation 20. So don't let all of those things get you too wound up around the axle. If that army, if all the armies of the world tomorrow line up against Israel, that's where it's not our job to fix. Who's going to fix it? God's going to fix it. Every time Gog and Magog are mentioned, that's the result. Okay, so keep that in mind as we're looking at this. King of the North, can we, can we put that back up or did it go away for good? Um, okay, so King of the North, Seleucid. Say it with me, Seleucid. King of the South, Ptolemy. For I don't know why Ptolemy starts with a P, but Ptolemy starts with a P. I don't know. So if you look along the Mediterranean, you guys see the Mediterranean there? Uh, to the left of the brown? If I had a pointer, I'd point at it. That's Egypt, the, the edge of the brown moving toward Libya. And there's something called the Via, uh, Via de, de Maris, is that right? Via, Via de Maris. Via de Maris. I think it's Via de Maris. The way of the sea. So the way of the sea is the trade route that runs from Egypt along the Mediterranean, all along the Mediterranean Ocean, and then it shoots across to Babylon. Because Babylon has all the money. And Egypt has all the goods. And so they're trading always from Egypt to Babylon. So if, does it matter if you control this piece of land if you control that piece of land where all the trade is happening then you get to tax everybody who's buying and everybody who's traveling and everybody who's selling so the Ptolemies control the majority of it and then the Seleucids control the rest and they're going to spend 400 years fighting over who gets to be in charge of that you want to take a guess at what nation is in the middle of that brown right on the way of the sea. So every time an army comes from the north to the south, they're going to come through Israel. Israel's going to get slapped around. Every time an army goes from the south to the north, they're going to pass through Israel. There's going to be a lot of trauma that's going to be associated with what's going on. I got another map. You guys have that one too? Oh, man, I, I cut it off the wrong way. Okay, so once again, you can't see any of the Ptolemy. So, never mind. So the green, uh, well, did, go ahead and leave it back up. I'm sorry. Uh, you guys see all that tan? That's Russia. So the tan up above, uh, not all of it, but from the middle of the Black Sea back to the right, that's all Russia. So I'm not saying Russia's not above them, but it's way beyond the realm of where the Bible's talking about nations, okay? Just so you can kind of get the geography in your mind. So as we look at these next 20 verses, we're going to go kind of quick through them, and I'm going to have the verse, and then I'm going to have the fulfillment, the historical fulfillment. Here's what I want you to understand. God was in control of it all. He told us what was going to happen hundreds of years before it did, and it reads just like a history book. This is why some 
uh, scholars in the world, unbelieving scholars, look at Daniel and don't know what to do with it. Okay, Daniel was in the Septuagint, which was copied into Greek in 270 B.C. So there's, there's no way for all of this to have been historically written, like after it happened. So the scholars are, are a little bit, I don't have a problem because I start with the Bible where it starts, in the beginning, God. Uh, if, if God says, it can happen. So God tells us what's going to happen. Daniel chapter 11 is an amazing chapter. It may be a little bit dry today as we look at the history, but Daniel chapter 11 is the one that's going to give us the key links to Antichrist. So if you want to understand Antichrist and what we're looking for in, in that realm, it's all Daniel 11, and then Daniel uh, finishes up in Daniel chapter 12. So, so all of this is important for us to get a little bit of an understanding. All right, we're going to start with the king of the south. We're going to move fast. Everybody ready? Okay, engage your mind. Here we go. Verse 5, the king of the south will be strong, but one of his princes <clears throat> shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. Fulfillment, the king of the south was to be Ptolemy the first, son of Lagos, whose ambitions extended far beyond the borders of Egypt, over which Alexander had put him in charge from uh, all the way to Palestine and the rest of Asia. Verse 6, After some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she will not retain the strength of her arm, and, and he and his arm will not endure. But she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. Here's the fulfillment. The agreement was a proposed peace treaty that called for Antiochus II to marry Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy II. But Antiochus already had a wife, a powerful and influential woman named Laodice. She did not take kindly to being divorced for a political uh, marriage. Therefore, she organized a conspiracy. She managed to have both Berenice and her infant son that she had born to Antiochus assassinated. Not long afterward, the king himself was poisoned to death, 247 B.C. And the pro-Laodice party engineered a coup d'etat that put her in power as the queen regent during the, uh, during the minority of her son, Seleucus II. In this manner... The prophecy was fulfilled concerning Berenice that she should be handed over uh, along with the nobles who supported her in Antioch. Look at verse 7. And from a branch from her roots, this is talking about Berenice, a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place and come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and deal with them and shall prevail. Ptolemy Philadelphus was succeeded by Ptolemy Eurigides, who was the brother of Berenice. She is uh, the branch from her roots. Uh, Ptolemy Eurigides organized a great expeditionary force against Syria in order to avenge his sister's death. The war raged from 246 to 241. Finally, he returned to Egypt laden with spoil. He succeeded on other fronts as well, for he reunited Cyrenaica at the western end of Libya with the Ptolemaic domains after it had enjoyed 12 years of independence. He also recovered all his father's conquests on the coast of Asia Minor and temporarily gained control of some of the portions of Thrace. We go on to verse 8. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold, and for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. So Ptolemy III recovered the idols and 40,000 talents of silver of Egypt taken by Cambyses in 524. So he's going to bring those things back, uh, back home. Verse 9, Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Seleucus Kalanikis, or Seleucus II, 
conducted an invasion of Egypt, although he never entered Egypt itself. He retained uh, control of northern Syria and Phoenicia. Um, now, in verse 10, the focus is going to shift to the king of the north. So this has all been things dealing with the king of the south. It's always against one another, but you get the idea. The prominence of the north in verse 10. His sons shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through again, shall carry the war as far as his fortress. So again, Seleucus, Callinicus had two sons, Serenus and Antiochus the Great. They stirred up for war. After Serenus was killed in Asia Minor, Antiochus the Great moved through Egyptian territory and captured the Egyptian fortress Gaza. Ptolemy Philopater offered no resistance at this time. Okay, Daniel 11, 11. Then the king of the south, <clears throat> moved with rage, uh, shall come out and fight against the king of the north, and he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. Ptolemy Philopater raised a huge army, 73,000 men, 5,000 cavalry, 73 elephants, and overcame Antiochus the Great, so that the army of Antiochus came into the hands of the Ptolemies. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart will be exalted, and he will be cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. Ptolemy Philopater defeated Antiochus at Raphia, caused the Syrians to lose 10,000 infantry, 300 cavalry, five elephants, and took 4,000 prisoners. One of those is a guy named Antiochus IV. You're going to want to remember that name. He's coming back. <clears throat> Verse 13. For the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first, and after some years he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. Antiochus the Great raised a greater army because of the successes in the east in 203 B.C. Antiochus saw his opportunity to strike at Egypt again. Since Ptolemy IV had just died and was succeeded by Ptolemy V, who just happened to be four years old. Daniel eleven fourteen 14. It says, In those times many shall rise against the king of the south. Yeah, because he's four years old. And the violent among your own people shall lift uh, themselves up in order to fulfill the vision. But they shall fail. Ptolemy Philopater died and was succeeded by his son uh, of four years, Ptolemy Epiphanes. Uh, realizing a weakness in Egypt, many rose in rebellion, including Antiochus the Great, who made a league with Philip of Macedon, some rebels within Egypt, and even some of the Jews, who allied with Antiochus against Egypt. Verse 15. Then the king of the north <clears throat> shall come and throw up siege works, and take a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not stand, or even its best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. As Antiochus came against Egypt, the Egyptian general Scopus came out against him, and they were defeated when Antiochus took Sidon. Verse 16. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. So Antiochus then turned his attention toward Israel, the glorious land. And was irresistible. However, Antiochus treated Israel with favor because they had helped him against Egypt. This is not the bad Antiochus yet. Don't get confused just because everybody names their kid their same name. That's why I give you Ptolemy 1, Ptolemy 2, Ptolemy 3, Ptolemy 4. I know it's confusing, but if you look, the incredible thing as we look at Daniel 11 is God speaks prophetically right alongside the history book of the things that happened in the Seleucid and the Ptolemy empires. Before they happen, remember, the Septuagint is finished and translated into Greek in 270 B.C. 
these things are happening in the 230s. It can't have been written after it happened. It was written before it happened. And it follows line for line with a history book. It's crazy. But it tells us that God knows what's going on in the world. Right? That God knows what's happening. That God is in control. That God is in charge. He is telling Daniel all the events that are going to take place. Daniel's in heaven. He's not going to be here. <laughs> but the Lord tells him so that we would know God is the God of the ages. He knows what's going on. He knows the things that are happening. Verse 17. He shall set his face to come with strength of his whole kingdom. And he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. And he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom. But it shall not stand or be to his advantage. So Antiochus determined to completely destroy Egypt... So he contracted an agreement whereby he gave his daughter Cleopatra. Not probably the one you're thinking. There's more than one of those two. Uh, his daughter Cleopatra in marriage to Ptolemy Epiphanes. He hoped she would be more faithful to her father than to her husband, but she was not. And the scheme failed. Verse 18. Afterwards he will turn his face to the coastlands... And shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he will turn his insolence back upon him. So Antiochus then turned his attention to the Mediterranean coast and islands. This brought him in conflict with a little bitty country called Rome. So you remember when we began, God tells Daniel, you got three more kings, and then there's a king who's going to stir up Greece. Which is eventually going to bring Greece to conquer the Medo-Persians. Now you're seeing Greece and there's this fella stirring up the Romans. Which is eventually the next kingdom, right? That's going to take over from Greece. So you have this going on. He was, it says Antiochus um, came into conflict with the Romans. He was defeated in Magnesia in 190 BC by the Roman Lucius Scipio. And his boastings came back upon his own head. In 188 B.C., the Romans forced Antiochus to sign the Treaty of Apamea. Polybius reported that the Syrian king was ordered to surrender territory, much of his military force, 20 hostages, one of which was Antiochus IV, and pay a heavy, a heavy indemnity to Rome. So he's going to be super taxed by Rome. Verse 19, then he will turn his face back toward the fortresses of his own land. But he will stumble and fall and shall not be found. After his humiliating defeat, Antiochus returned to his country where he was killed by an angry mob in 187 B.C. In desperate needs of funds, he decided to raid a uh, temple to Zeus but was killed in the process as the citizens were defending the temple. Verse 20, Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he will be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. The son and successor of Antiochus III was Seleucus IV, who sent a tax collector, Heliodorus, to collect money and pay the thousand talents indemnity demanded annually by the Romans as part of the treaty. According to 2 Maccabees, Seleucus even sent Heliodorus to plunder the temple in Jerusalem in order to provide funds for the Syrian treasury. But a frightful vision of angels stopped him from plundering the temple in Jerusalem. Seleucus IV reigned only a few years and was not killed by an angry mob in anger like his father or in battle. Heliodorus, his tax collector and prime minister, poisoned the king to take control. Probably helped by that guy whose name keeps coming up, Antiochus IV. As we look at this, the next section from verses 21 to 35 are all about the guy in history 
who becomes the example of the Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus the fourth. The one <clears throat> that will see the horrendous things he does in the glorious land. We're going to look at that next time. So I, I know it's a little bit weird tonight. It's like, oh man, that was like I got a really fast history lesson. But I want you to understand that the incredible thing about Daniel 11 is God prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before the events, but they will read right beside a history book. And we don't have to go, I wonder what this means, because we can point right to it. We can follow the line of events. Why does that matter? Why do these things make any difference? Well, we sang a couple of songs tonight. I just want to remind you of them. In, Re in Revelation chapter 5, when the church is, is gathered together in heaven and we are together uh, with the elders and the angels and we're singing praises to the king, we are saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals. The scroll as the title deed of planet earth. Who's in control of what's happening on earth? Look, it's not Putin, it's not Zelensky, it's not Biden for sure. It's not China, it's not all the other things we think. What we need to understand is the God who can tell you what's going to happen before it happens is the one who's in control. He's in charge. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be worried about it. He is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed the people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. How many people around the world has God saved? From everyone, from every group, from every country, right? Are the Russians saved? For sure. Is there a church there? Yeah, what about in Ukraine? Yeah, what about in China? Yeah, he has saved people from every tribe and tongue. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. And they shall reign in the earth. Do you know where all this is going? If you were back in Israel at the time of this north and south battle and everybody, every time you turn around, there's another army walking through your yard. You would be saying, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on? But if you read the book of Daniel, you'd be able to say, oh, the Lord told us several hundred years before this happened, this was coming. Has the Lord told us about what the end times were going to look like? Is it to make us afraid? No. Is to help us know God is in control. So what is it that the group, us together with the angels, are saying to the Lord? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. To receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And then John says, I heard every creature in heaven, on the earth and under the earth. It's everybody making this proclamation to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. God is bringing history to its proper conclusion. How many times when God stands before the people does he say these words? Do not be afraid. The Lord says, don't be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No matter what happens, if gas prices go higher, he's still with us. I saw the greatest meme of all time today. You guys know what a meme is? I saw the greatest meme. It says, probably because gas prices were going so high, that's why all the armies in Revelation are riding horses. <laughs> they might have something there. <laughs> they might have something there. So I hope that you'll enjoy this journey. Two more weeks, we'll be in 11. Next week, talking a lot about the precursor to the Antichrist. And then the third week, talking a lot about the future Antichrist and how it all ties in together with Bible prophecy for the end of days. Sound good? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word, what your word is declaring, God. We thank you for the truth of Scripture. We do not have to be afraid because the God of the universe has written history before it has come to pass. Lord, you tell us so that we can know, so that we can put our faith and our hope and our trust, Lord God, 
in what you have done, what you are accomplishing, and what you continue to accomplish. Lord, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt all the things that you have planned for those who love you. We thank you, Lord, that we can um, just hold fast to your truth, that we can say, look, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be dismayed because God is with me wherever I go. No matter where I am, no matter what is going on, I can put my trust and my hope in him. So, Lord, we thank you for the truth that you have told us, the end before it comes. Not so that we would be afraid, not so that we would despair, but, God, so that we could know you are in control. We give you all the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling now to him who is able to make you blameless before the prayer of his glory in his great joy praise to the only God our Savior Jesus Christ our Lord Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and here today, and forever. Amen. Be glory. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, here today and forever. Out of him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Now to him who is able to make you blameless. To make and magnified as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.